welcome to all who have joined us online for worship. I'm the Reverend Stephanie Munsell, and it is my joy to serve Myersville Presbyterian Church and the First Presbyterian Church of Sterling, two Presbyterian churches in Long Hill, New Jersey, partnering together. I have a few announcements to share um, about the life of our busy two little congregations. And the first is that we continue to have our Bible study every other Sunday, and it is this Sunday, June 16th. We will be at the First Presbyterian Church of Sterling um, Sunday morning, and we meet after worship. So you are welcome to join us at around 1115. You can go through fellowship um, hour and have grab some goodies, and then come to the meeting room um, where we will meet for about an hour uh, to study scripture. And it is a uh, Father's Day, so we will study a text about Father Abraham. Please know that you are very welcome to join us. I'd also like to share that our mission of the month continues to be Village to Village. Village to Village began in 2003 with only $100 to help nine school-aged children in Uganda. Those children lived with elderly or sick grandparents or no adults at all. And it has grown to serve over 200 people, many with special needs and some living with HIV and AIDS. With God's help and support from congregations like ours, um, it has become a staffed organization uh, as known in Uganda as a non-governmental organization, an NGO. And they now have partners in 40 countries um, reaching from one village into the rural villages of Africa to serve some of the world's most uh, desperate children. If you would like to support this truly global ministry, please make a donation to your home church, um, send in an envelope to our church offices, and mark the check or the envelope in the memo uh, to V2V. And we will be um, sure to make sure that that gets to this important ministry. Lastly, I'd like to share a small stewardship reminder. Your consistency in making your pledge um, and supporting your contribution is so greatly appreciated. Even as the summer months mean travel and vacation, the churches, our churches continue to have financial obligations. And so we welcome receiving your contributions to our ministries, to this ministry, um, through the mail. We thank you so much for your generosity. And now I invite you to turn your hearts and all you are to worshiping God. Let us worship God together.
For our call to worship, I invite you to sing with us a setting of Psalm 139. From Paul's letter to the church at Rome. Chapter 8. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very Spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if, in fact, we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. Not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Okay. Good morning, madam. How can I help you? Oh, uh, well, yes. Um... I have a touch of dishonesty, mm -hmm. so I'd like to have some truth, please. Um, apparently, that's very effective, and I've been all over the place, and I cannot find it anywhere. Uh, of course, madam. <clears throat> um, what kind of truth would you like? Hmm. You mean what kind of truth? 
Like, I, I thought there was only one. I thought there was only one. Um, no. No, madam. Um, let me see. Uh, there is, for example, relative truth. Okay. It's very simple to apply. And listen, <clears throat> everything is relative. There is a no absolute truth expect, except the absolute truth that there is no absolute truth. Okay. Truth is what's true for you. It's great for solving a uh, guilty conscience. Oh dear, that all sounds a bit too philosophical for me. I'd just like some truth, please. Okay. How about half-truth? Okay. Uh, this is very good. It's quick acting, uh, but it doesn't have a long-lasting effect, I'm afraid. Um, fast relief for those everyday embarrassing moments. Okay. I'm not sure I follow. Well, for example, uh, half-truth will give you the courage to say to your neighbor, I'm terribly sorry, but someone has run over your cat Ooh. without having to tell them it was you. Oh, okay, I get it. Um, I'm not sure. Um, what about the others? The others. Okay, so no half-truth. No. Um, how about the whole truth? <laughs> okay. Um, can you tell me a little bit more? It sounds uh, a lot better. Yep, yep. Um, so the whole truth. Uh, it's very wholesome, uh, indeed. Um, you might call uh, it the truth with not a drop taken out. Um, it's excellent. It's very effective indeed, especially if you have a bit of a blockage. <laughs> it's full of moral fiber. Oh, okay. Well, um, that sounds pretty good, but what about that huge box over there? The big one on the, on the oh, top shelf? Oh, yes. That one, man. It's the uh, ultimate and definite truth. It includes uh, ultimate morality, mm -hmm. uh, perfect justice, mm -hmm. and the meaning of life. Okay. It's all in there, man. Wow. You, all you... Uh, all you need to know okay. and it can be unpleasant to take and uncomfortable to live with but it's uncompromising but the results are remarkable this is the absolute truth truth there is a lot of it so it must be very powerful yes it is the best it's totally effective uh, all you have to do is take it However, I am sure you can appreciate, ma'am, it is a bit hard to swallow. Oh, oh, um, okay. Um, yeah, I think so. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. yeah. Well, ma'am, um, so what would you like? Huh, let me see. Um, you have a lot to choose from. Yep. Um, I think I'll have a pack of the half troops, please. Okay, 12, 24, or 48. 12, 24, 48. Um, let me think. Um, do 24. Okay, 24. And, and something else? Uh, let me think. Sorry, I just have to get my mind around it. Um, mm. Yes, I'll no, I'll have a box of the week excuses. Yes, three hundred fifty-six okay. excuses. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. and a tissue of white lies. White lies. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. And okay. those statistics, statistics, they, they look really nice. Yes. I'll have a bunch of those. A bunch of those. Okay. Okay. Oh, thank that's you. it. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. See you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, Bye. Bye now. And from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 13. Jesus put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field. But while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. 
And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? And he answered, An enemy has done this. The slave said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, No, for in gathering the weeds, you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, Collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. And then Jesus' interpretation of this parable. Then he left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples approached him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. And he answered, The one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers and they will throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Let anyone with ears listen. Thanks be to God for the word given us in scripture. Amen. also been a couple of movies of the story, one with Gene Wilder and later Johnny Depp as the reclusive and peculiar Willy Wonka who owns the chocolate factory. And then there's Charlie Bucket who is this poor and but very good boy who dreams of winning the golden ticket which will allow him to tour the chocolate factory that has been so long closed to all outsiders. And at the last possible moment, of course, Charlie does indeed find a ticket and he wins his tour. He's accompanied on his tour by four other ticket-winning children, all of them horrible in one way or another. Veruca Salt is a spoiled brat. Augustus Gloop is, just as his name suggests, gluttonous. Violet Beauregard constantly chews gum in a loud and disgusting manner. Mike TV watches TV all the time, and he tries to emulate the manner of the cowboys and the gangsters he loves. 
Well, the children's tour guide is none other than the secretive Willy Wonka himself, accompanied by his workers, the Oompa Loompas. And Veruca Salt loudly demands of her father at each stage of the tour through the amazing factory, Daddy, I want a boat like this, and I want lots of Oompa Loompas to row me about, and I want a chocolate river, and I want, I want. And the other children are just as bad in their own ways. Gum chewing was not allowed in, in our family when I was growing up. So Violet Beauregard always had a kind of lurid and especially disgusted appeal in our house. Well, the awful children get in trouble when they disobey Willy Wonka's um, instructions as the tour proceeds. And one by one, these awful children are punished in some spectacularly horrifying and delightfully satisfying ways. And Charlie Bucket gets a wonderful and life-changing reward at, at the end of the story. And this is what feels so good about this story. The good kid is rewarded and the bad ones get what's coming to them. Such a, a nicely worked out good versus evil, light versus dark, dualistic world where in the end goodness and light triumph. And this is not just true in children's books. Though we know better, we secretly and sometimes not so secretly delight in what we call comeuppance, whether it is personal or in politics. So we love it when the wicked are punished when the unrighteous are mowed down, when the weeds are uprooted from the garden. And Jesus seems to go along with this. He says, collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. And the interpretation of the parable provided continues the idea of final judgment and the consequences of good and bad of reward and punishment. And this seems all very neat and satisfying to those who are pretty darn sure they are on the reward side, the good side. The trouble is that in real life, it doesn't seem to work out this way. And the Bible knows it. Several psalms complain about the wicked prospering and the righteous suffering. The prophet Habakkuk proclaimed, the wicked hem in the righteous so that justice is perverted. The whole book of Job tackles this problem. Job, the good man who suffers terribly. And of course, we see this in our own lives and in the newspaper all the time. However, I think there's more to be seen in this parable, more than a simple statement of reality about the day of judgment. Notice the trouble Jesus takes to explain that the landowner chose not to uproot the weeds at the beginning, but to let them grow alongside the wheat. Let, them, let both of them grow together until the harvest, he said. We have to take seriously the reality of God's judgment and the consequences of our, own, of our own behavior. But we also have to hear what Jesus is saying about the danger of making judgments of our own along the way. He says, leave the weeds to me. You just worry about growing up wheat. The parable goes like this. A householder sows good seed in his field, and an enemy comes and sows weeds among the wheat. Well, it's a nasty little case of agricultural vandalism. And so when the wheat comes up, of course, the weeds appear as well. 
the farm workers come to the owner and they say, boss, we've got a problem. Weeds among the wheat. Shall we pull them up? And this seems, you know, like the thing to do. We all spend summers keeping after the weeds in our grass and in our gardens. But the householder tells them, he tells them something different. No, because in gathering the weeds, you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let them grow together until the harvest. A full-scale attack on the weeds might destroy the good wheat in the process. Harvest time will be soon enough for gathering the weeds. Now, I don't know if this makes sense agriculturally, but since Jesus isn't really talking about wheat and weeds, but about human beings, I don't suppose it really matters. Jesus takes a totally non-Willy Wonka-ish approach to rooting out evil. While Mr. Wonka doesn't bat an eye as Augustus Gloop plunges into a chocolate river, as Violet turns into this enormous big round blueberry, as Mike disappears into a transporter beam, and Veruca slides down a garbage chute, Jesus is committed to wheat and weeds together until the wheat is fully developed. He himself doesn't rush to judge, and so he doesn't want his servants to be too quick either. But leaving the weeds to Jesus is not always easy in this world of ours. Sides are taken on so many things, and the arguments become shrill and, and bitter very quickly. We see this in our country today with the polarization labeled by the media as the red and blue state divide. Somehow, even wearing a mask has become a political statement. We see this divide across the world, Muslim versus Christian, the US versus the rest of the world. We see it in the widening gap between rich and poor, between white and black. We even see it in the church. Christians right and left, who so righteously proclaim that those who disagree with them are the weeds in the garden of life, while they and their friends are the flowers and the beauty of the garden. And we do it ourselves when we judge one another by appearances. A, a pastor of a big church in Chicago like to tell the story of this, this certain Bishop Potter. And the Bishop was sailing to Europe on one of those great big transatlantic ocean liners many years ago. And when he got on board, he found that he would be sharing his, his cabin with another passenger, someone that he didn't know. And after going to, to see the accommodations to check out his cabin, he went to the purser's desk and asked whether he could leave his, his gold watch and some other valuables in the ship's safe. And he explained to the purser that he didn't or ordinarily do this, but that he had been to his cabin and had met the man who was to occupy the other berth. And judging from the appearance of the other man, he was afraid that he might not be a very trustworthy person. Well, the purser accepted the valuables from, from Bishop Potter, and he said, it's all right, Bishop. I'll be very glad to, to take care of your, your valuables. The other man in your cabin has been up here and left his valuables for the same reason. No wonder Jesus instructs us to hold off on the weed pulling. For in gathering the weeds, you would uproot the wheat along with them. There was a, a, a seminar 
leader was teaching a group of government workers and showed the class a series of pictures. And the pictures began with a close-up of a person's face. And then the focus would widen out to show the person's entire body and then the scene surrounding him or her. And the first picture showed the face of a kind of grizzled man and he was kind of grimacing and scowling and he looked like a member of a scary motorcycle gang gripping what appeared to be might be the handlebars of his Harley. But when the whole picture was revealed, it became clear that he was the maker of custom wheelchairs and he was, he was pushing one of his creations. We don't always have the whole picture. And so we have to leave the weeding to Jesus. Instead of worrying about whether others are towing the line, our challenge is to grow ourselves into strong, fruitful wheat. And the best news is that healthy growth and maturity are the most effective forms of weed control. When the grass in your yard is healthy, it's competitive and it will crowd out most of the weeds. The weeds become less of a factor when our faith is healthy, when it's mature, and it can compete favorably against whatever invading weeds, against invading temptations. Parents find this out when we're raising our kids. We would love to shield our kids from every sort of bad influence. When our children are very little, we can often, you know, we can manage this for a while. Nothing but Sesame Street on TV, only organic food, only happily ever after stories, never unacceptable language in the house, no toy guns, and only nice children over to play. But that sure doesn't last very long. They go to school and they bring home words you'd hope they'd never hear. A pet dies, a friend's parents divorce, and they, they start to hear about things like drugs or about war or about poverty. And then they are wheat surrounded by weeds. And as you know, the way to combat this as a parent is really the only route left, to focus on growing strong wheat strong and good children, rather than trying to rip out every weed, shield them from all knowledge of hurtful things. Seeing the good rewarded, rewarded and the bad punished, it's delicious, as tasty as the treats in Willy Wonka's factory. But I think Jesus is saying that such treats are not usually good for us. We do not always perceive the whole picture and are therefore not always reliable in our ability to judge the wheat from the weeds, the good from the bad. We really don't need Willy Wonka in the church, meeting out judgment on the good and the bad. It would be enough to be like Charlie Bucket, a kid who is kind and brave and true, patience, and focusing on growing and maturing in faith, helping others, helping others to know the love of God. These are the ways we fulfill the expectations and the hopes of the one who, who planted us in the first place. As people of faith, we are part of a healthy, fruitful harvest that will someday be reaped by the angels of God. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for planting your word within us as good seed, germinating new life through Jesus Christ. Give us grace, we pray, that we may grow into this likeness. Grant us courage that we may remain steadfast against the works of the weeds. Make us wholesome, that our world may taste and see that you are good. Help us to be fruitful, that your name may be glorified. And fill us with hope, 
as we await with joy your harvest. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Let us pray. Wherever we are, O God, we know that you are present with us, that we are united in Christ, and that your Spirit intercedes for us. There is nowhere we can flee from your Spirit, and nothing we cannot say to the one who created us. And so, O God, we share with you now the hopes of our hearts, the questions on our minds, and the worries that keep us up at night. You are like no other the first and the last, the beginning and the end, the one in whom we live and move and have our being. Lord, from whom we cannot flee, we ask you for wisdom in the face of ever-growing uncertainties. We remember those in our midst and those known only to you who are consumed with fear. Fear not only for their livelihoods, but for their very lives. Grant us the resolve to do whatever is required for everyone to have enough to eat, a safe place to live, the ability to get the care they need, and an education that values individuals and creates a society of people of character. Do not let our imagination fall short of your ability to make all things possible. Loving God, who searches and knows us, reveal to us those places in our heart that need to be broken so that we might go to the places in the world that break your heart. Do not let us turn away from the people who need to know that they are not alone. Ease the loneliness of those unable to see their families and those without family. We pray for those on the margins of our society, the imprisoned and the impoverished, those who have been neglected and those seeking asylum and safety. Do not let us reject or ignore those whom Jesus came to save. Generous God who overwhelms us with goodness and mercy, we thank you for waking us up this day, giving us this gift of life, calling us to be your people. When we are tempted to judge others harshly, remind us to forgive as we have been forgiven. When we feel paralyzed with doubt or awash in anxiety, grant us the peace that passes understanding. When we do not know what to do or where to turn, make your word a light for our path so that we can take one step closer to Christ as he leads us in the way everlasting. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.